sailors or seamen, what's something you've witnessed that you would catalog as a supernatural or unusual event? Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. This happened to me and my father while not exactly on open water. In the late 80s and early 90s, my dad was living and working around the Prince William Sound in Alaska as a logger. I would often visit him during the summer, and it was great fun. One year, I visited in December due to plans I had coming up that summer. He lived with a few other loggers very remotely on a lake in a houseboat. I remember having to take a ferry, truck, and snowmobile, then dingy, to reach the boat from Anchorage. This year, being December, the lake was frozen, and we just rode the snowmobiles directly across the ice. My second night, it was crystal clear from the cold, and all the stars were out. My dad and his logging buddies were up late drinking, playing music, and just relaxing. I was sitting at a window playing a Game Boy. I looked out the window, and on the far side of the lake, probably a quarter mile away, I saw a polar bear walking on hind legs. I was really excited, as I have never seen a polar bear before. I yelled and said to my dad, look like a bear. My dad and his buddies all jumped out of their seats with very serious looks on their faces, grabbed pairs of binoculars, and looked through them, saying there shouldn't be any polar bears in that particular area. And while my father was looking through the binoculars, he said, Tom, it's back, Tom being one of the fellas there. As they looked at it through the binoculars, it moved slowly across the far side of the lake, up the bank, and into the trees. Tom ran into the other room and came out with rifles. The attitude around the boat had completely changed, everybody was on edge, and any sense of relaxation was gone. Each of them holding a rifle. This is the first time I've ever seen fear in my dad's face. They stayed up the rest of the night, I don't believe anybody slept. My dad wouldn't speak to me about it at all, saying it was just a bear. The next morning, it was as if it never happened, and he never brought it up again. I had completely forgotten about this until years later, when it just popped into my mind. So I called my dad and asked him about it. He said he remembered it vividly. He told me that throughout the winter months of that year, and only while the lake was frozen, they had seen what they had also thought to be a bear walking on its hind legs, which isn't uncommon for bears to do sometimes. Worried the bear was getting too close to the houseboat because of the frozen ice one night, they fired some shots to scare it off. The shots didn't seem to phase it at all, and it continued to come back almost nightly and cross the ice. Finally, they got fed up with its strange behavior and looked at it through a set of binoculars to see what was wrong with it. My dad said at this point that what they saw still scared him to think about it to this day. What they saw wasn't a bear at all, but instead looked like a giant floating white jellyfish that was glowing and gliding across the top of the ice. They would see it until the ice melted later that year, and each time they saw it, my dad said it would make them feel anxiety and fear. Once the lake thawed, they never saw it again. Within a year of this incident, he had moved back to the continental US. I was in the US Navy for several years and saw some interesting stuff. One of my favorites was New Year's Eve 2009. It was approaching midnight, and so maybe a dozen people were out on the deck smoking, waiting for the new year. The water was perfectly still in every direction, there were barely any ripples in the water, even except for our ship slipping through. There was bioluminescence scattered around, so there was just a general glow in every direction, like the reflection of stars. Except the water was so still, it was also reflecting the stars above. There was no moon that night. The overall effect was that you couldn't tell where the horizon was or even the water for the mast part. It all looked like a black sky with stars, like we were floating through space. The scene in Pirates of the Caribbean, second one, I think, where they sail off the edge of the world is really close to what it looked like. A group of jellyfish used to float by two, and they flashed periodically. So you would have these really slow moving, pulsating lights drifting under you and around the decks. Beautiful, but freaking eerie. I also saw dolphins blazing around underwater when the bioluminescence was at high levels in the water. They leave trails behind them like comets. Near the Gulf of Aden, the water each morning would be perfectly still. I would go outside for a few minutes each morning, and seeing perfectly flat seas in every direction was always very odd. I didn't know the ocean would do that. Finally, we were out in the middle of the ocean one day, about to do quals on some of the guns we have on deck. We were just about to start firing the M240 when a whale showed up right in the firing line. Then another and another, then dolphins. Within two minutes, 
The seas went from being pretty calm to hosting around five whales and dozens of dolphins all jumping and cruising around. Poseidon himself decided we would not be shooting that day. I was standing in the hangar bay, waiting for morning muster at dawn, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Looking out at the ocean, I was intrigued by how smooth as glass the water was, reflecting the clouds in the sky. Then the most beautiful, confusing, mesmerizing, and terrifying thing I ever saw happened. The water, for a moment, was so smooth that the horizon disappeared from view. The water was so smooth and reflective that it was impossible to tell where the water ended and the sky began. I honestly got dizzy knowing I was in the middle of the ocean floating on water, but my eyes were trying to convince me the ship was floating on nothing. Then the water started slightly rippling, and the horizon was visible again. Every morning at sea after that, I looked at the horizon, hoping it would happen again, but it never did. I've never found out what caused this scientifically. The closest thing I could ever find was that it was some sort of variant of the Fata Morgana Mirage. I don't think I will ever see anything as beautiful in my life again. Words fall extremely short at describing the feeling in that moment. I was in the US Navy and worked in communications. I was a supervisor on my watch and enjoyed working the night tours while on deployment. We stood 12-hour watches from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Around 2 a.m., I hear some chatter over the 3 MC, which is like our internal speaker system used between a few different stations on the ship. It's the bridge asking combat if they see anything on surface or air radar, maybe 10 miles out to our west. Combat returns with a negative, and I don't think anything of it. About 15 minutes go by, and the bridge asks again, are they sure there's nothing there? Then they ask us if we have any message traffic about any ships in the area, aircraft, or anomalous weather patterns. I asked one of the guys on watch to perform the request, and now my interest is piqued. I walk out of the communication center and head up to the bridge. I was on a frigate, so the walk was quick, and I got up there and asked what's going on. One of my buddies points me over to the port side, and we walk over. There's about 5 or 6 circular shaped lights about 10 to 15 miles out in the clouds, pretty large. They aren't moving or flying around, they are just looking stable. These lights are also casting lights downward on the ocean, and you can see the light refracting back at the water, almost as if it were a spotlight or a beam. From what we could see, it didn't appear to be lights shining up from the water because they wouldn't pass through the clouds. The clouds also weren't super thick, they were lightly overcast, and it was the middle of the night with no other light pollution on the water. There was nothing in the message traffic about any ships, subs, or aircraft in the area. We were hundreds of miles from land, and the last report of any unusual weather patterns was a water spout a few hundred miles away. We tried to take pictures with our onboard digital camera, using a long exposure, but we couldn't capture the phenomenon. After about 90 minutes, the light slowly faded, one by one, and within 15 minutes, they had completely disappeared. I'm sure there's some sort of weather or atmospheric condition for what we saw, but for all intents and purposes, it fit the description of a UFO, or unidentified flying object. I work security on different ships. One time during night shift on a cruise ship, my colleague and I were in the security office watching the CCTV cameras and just talking some stuff to pass the time. At the exact same time, we both saw a black figure or shadow pass in front of the camera in the children's play area. We both got super freaked out but kept watching the other cameras in the vicinity to see if whatever it was passed by those, as it was the only way it could go from where we saw it and there was no way it could leave the area without passing by in front of one of the cameras. It never did, so we went to the area to check it out but obviously found nothing. Afterwards, we went back to review the footage and didn't see any shadows moving in that camera again. Even though we both saw it for the first time in the live feed, needless to say, we kind of started avoiding the kids area at night after that. A lot of death happens out at sea. I was on navigation watch with the second mate one night off the Philippines. The ship was on autopilot, making for Manila. It was a clear, still dark night. Through the binoculars, I picked up the navigation lights of another ship about 5 degrees off the port bow. It was well off, but I noted the bearing and checked the radar. Nothing, this was not unusual. If it was one of the small local fishing vessels, they can be hard to pick up. On the other hand, they usually don't bother with navigation lights either. Quickish technical detail, skip if familiar with the purpose and function of navigation lights. Navigation lights on a vessel are baffled, so they can only be seen from a certain direction. 
looking at a boat dead ahead, coming toward you, you will see a red light to the right of a green light. This is what I could see. If the boat turns to its right, or starboard, the two lights will begin to move together, and the green light will fade from view because of the baffles that are around it. As the turn continues, you will be able to see the red port, their left side, light only, and a bit later, the white stern light will appear as the red fades behind its baffles. This way, you can tell in an instant the orientation of another vessel in the dark. Ten minutes passed, and I checked the bearing again. Still five degrees off the port bow, red and green are visible. I checked the radar again, still nothing. I alerted the second mate. Five minutes later, nothing changed, nothing was on the radar. We were in a collision with an invisible vessel that was steadily getting closer. As a precaution, we switched back to manual steering, and I took the helm. By now, I could make out the lights without the binoculars, still coming directly at us. We were on the verge of taking evasive measures when suddenly the lights started moving together. We assumed that the other vessel had finally spotted us and was turning away to their right. I was expecting the red light to fade from view. Except it didn't. The two lights simply swapped positions, the red went to the left and the green went to the right. They remained 5 degrees off the port bow. And then they moved back again. Still, nothing on radar, nothing through the binoculars. We eventually passed the lights within 20 meters. From the wing of the bridge, I could see with perfect clarity straight down at it, whatever it was. There was nothing to see except the two lights, one red and one green, floating freely in the air about 10 feet above the ocean, reflecting back off the waves and gently and occasionally swapping positions in the night. I only worked as a walk-on, walk-off cabin attendant, but the old sea dogs always had far-fetched stories to tell. The engineer teaching us about watertight doors told us a story that happened to him on another ship that the same company used to own but was decommissioned and scrapped in 2011. These watertight doors separate the different bulkheads, underwater compartments that stop the whole ship from sinking if there is a hole in the hull. Think about the metal doors that slid down in the engine room of the Titanic. These doors are always closed. To get from compartment to compartment, there was a lever that you pulled, and the door opened. You stepped through, and as soon as you let go of the lever, the door would close. For the safety of the ship, it would close tight, even if there was a person blocking it. On this older ship, there was an engineer who tripped and was crushed to death in one of these doors. Years later, this engineer who told me the story tripped and fell on that same door and was about to be crushed to death in the same way. But just before killing him, it stopped and opened again, despite no one being around and nothing touching the lever. And before anyone says that, there must have been some safety device installed. No, as I said before, the job of these doors is to close no matter what or who is in the way. I was an OV pilot on a ship mapping the Titanic debris field for the Titanic's 100-year anniversary episode on the History Channel. It was a 3 by 5 mile survey, so a lot of areas hadn't been mapped before. The ROF on board was taking video footage of the larger hull section and would bump into the Titanic when they got too close, and parts of the hull would get stuck to the ROF, which we called rusticles. I was 22 at the time, thought cool, part of the Titanic hull, and took a big chunk of iron hull. I wrote to my dad about it, very excited about my new artifact. He has been an ocean explorer for my whole life and is very easygoing pretty much all the time, but he became extremely serious after I told him. He said, let's not tempt fate here. Don't ever take anything from a grave site, ever. Throw it back in the ocean, please. I guess he has friends who swore they had become cursed after taking artifacts from grave sites, like the strange curses of the archaeologists who opened some of the pyramids of Egypt. So as any 22-year-old would do, I kept it in my bunk room. Sure enough, the next day I got this awful fever and felt terribly ill. I was very off and was bedridden on a work trip. No one else on the ship was sick, and of course I naturally thought, I'm cursed, I got the plague, so I threw it back when we were back over the wreck site, and sure enough, I got better that day. I mentioned it to some of our more senior team members, and they all had stories of people getting cursed after taking and keeping things from a grave site and that things would get better if they returned what they had taken. Weird juju there, respect the dead. This happened to a friend of mine, let's call him Dave, who worked on an offshore rig. He wasn't much of a believer in supernatural stuff or spirits. Mostly because he had never experienced anything and thought that most stories were just exaggerated. In the past, that rig faced a tragedy where it was set on fire and many people lost their lives. 
The captain at the time was the type of person who would help people first and then look after himself. He ran into a flaming room to help a few people who were stuck inside, and while helping them, he lost his life. As they were able to control the fire and eventually kill it, many people lost their lives, and it would take days for ships to arrive to carry the deceased back to the mainland. So they stored all the corpses in one room, that room was the captain's room. Years later, after the rig was rebuilt and functional again, Dave started working on it as a fresher. Being the new guy, he was given small jobs at first so that he would familiarize himself with everything. He didn't know this when he joined, but the room that was allotted to him was the same room that they stored the bodies in, as well as the captain's room. Dave was supposed to have a roommate bunk with him, but the guy would join him a week later. Before his roommate joined, every other night Dave would wake up to be violently shaken in his bed while hearing someone yell, there's a fire, there's a fire. He would also dream of people that he never knew, he'd see their faces, and the next thing would be glimpses of them burned. This frightened out a Dave. He approached his captain and spoke to him about all that happened. His captain then revealed the whole story of what happened and whose room he was occupying. The captain told Dave that if this persisted, he'd change the room. But fortunately, that was the same day Dave's roommate joined, and the thing stopped happening. One day, while getting off a crane from the ladder, Dave missed his step and was about to fall. Although it was just a few feet above the platform, with all the equipment he had on, he would have definitely fractured something and wouldn't be able to work for months. But as he was falling, someone held him from behind and pushed him back onto the ladder. He grabbed on and got down safely. As he turned to thank the person, he could find nobody there. When he went to the cafeteria, he asked his colleagues who were out there with him so that he could thank them. His colleagues revealed that he was the only one out there at that time. He found it weird but didn't say much about it. Dave approached the captain again and spoke to him about this. His captain told him that it was most likely the captain who died on the rig, saving and helping people while he still could. Now if you ask Dave about his belief in this stuff, he'll give you a really puzzled look as though he himself is still trying to make logic and reason out of what he experienced. I was in the USN from 2010 to 2014 and deployed twice on two different ships. The first ship I was on was the USS Pearl Harbor LSD-52, and we were deployed doing a West Pac. There was a span of time when we were just sailing around in open waters, not near any land whatsoever. I was one of the topside watch standers, meaning that I was responsible for reporting any other sea or air activity, i.e., other boats or airplanes. The area we were in was so incredibly remote that there was almost no activity anywhere, we didn't see a single boat or plane for days. One night, I was standing by the midnight to 4 a.m. watch and had just switched to the forward lookout. So I'm standing at the bridge of the ship on the outer deck, looking forward. It must have been about 3.45 a.m., because my relief just came up to let me know he would take over from here. We talked for a few minutes when, all of a sudden, I got a call from the bridge. The officer on duty was asking me what that was. Me and my watch relief look forward, and there is this giant light coming out of the ocean. This thing was huge, probably the size of two mobile homes put side by side. It comes up from the ocean and then passes overhead, maybe 70 feet from the top of the ship, and there was absolutely no sound. Everyone started freaking out. And the craziest thing is that none of our radars picked up any activity whatsoever. We were all just in awe. And no one had any explanation, but we all agreed that we witnessed a UFO. One of my dad's best friends in high school was a yacht guy, and he did the thing where he sailed around the world years and years ago. He went with his wife, my dad, my uncle, and a few others of their good friends. They always talked it up and never really shut up about it. When I was a cringy preteen, pretending and failing to be edgy, I asked what the worst part was. Dad, the yacht guy, his wife, and my uncle all got really quiet and uncomfortable. It took a little bit of prodding, but then they told us about the vest. On the final leg across the Atlantic, they were all tired and looking forward to only having about two and a half weeks left on the ocean. The yacht guy and his wife were below deck with my dad and uncle when they heard one of the other crew members shout that there was someone in the water. They got up on deck and started to immediately hear what sounded like a small child crying for help. My uncle, who's not really a talker, interjected that it wasn't an ambiguous or misunderstood scream, it was a clear and definite help. They all start looking around, trying to see any sign of the child. They said the ocean wasn't exactly calm, with rolling waves around them and no clear line of sight. The yacht wife said she saw what looked like a small, brightly bobbing child off the port stern. 
she says she yelled to my uncle, who was in the wheel, and they turned hard right, trying to get to the girl. After another minute of cries for help, there was suddenly a piercing scream and then silence. They all immediately jumped and turned behind them, each person thinking the scream had literally been behind their backs. At this point, they were all really freaked out until they looked back to the stern and saw an old yellow faded and frayed life jacket, not two yards off the bow. The yacht guy described it as an old life jacket, something from the 60s or maybe the 50s, but even old by the time they went on their trip. My dad grabbed a hook and tried to pull it in but missed, and the jacket quickly drifted out of reach. They said they all started watching it drift away. Right as it crested a wave and fell out of sight, all of them swore they saw a small child in the vest. Then it dropped onto the other side of the waver, and they didn't see it again. This gave me the heebie-jeebies when I heard this story, they might have been screwing with me, but my uncle got very disconcerting when telling the story with dad and yacht guy, which is concerning because he's usually a calm and level-headed guy. I work on a cargo ship on the Great Lakes here in Canada. Each time we leave a river or seaway, we have to walk across the deck, no matter the weather, and secure the anchors. It's an easy thing to do, and usually it's uneventful. It was a beautiful clear night, and as the stars twinkled, I couldn't help but gaze up at them as I walked the starboard deck forward. While I was looking up, I thought I heard someone to the left of me say, hey. Instinctively, I stopped, looked over, and saw no one, but as I went to start forward again, in front of me was a foot and a half high diamond plated step up. We have to cover the deck's array of pipes and cables. I would have tripped up and hit the steel deck like a bag of sand, as I've seen happen before. I thought it was coincidental, but the more time I spent on the deck, certain things kept happening, like the sound of footsteps, sometimes even my name being called, that made me curious about the presence of something or a higher power aboard. I brushed it off and let it sit in the back of my mind, and I convinced myself I wasn't going mad. Sure enough, the season ended, and I went home for the winter. When time came to head back in the spring, there was talk about a person named Larry amongst the winter work welders. They were talking about him as if he were a person of great interest, a person who was cheery but you don't mess with, a sailor, by the sounds of it. They talked about him messing around, causing a stir over the winter on multiple occasions. I decided to ask about this Larry guy, as in the marine industry people come and go, thinking I might know of him. It turns out Larry was an old seafarer who passed away years ago but still comes out for his watch on deck. Some said they'd seen him in the corner of their eye but paid no attention, as a deckhand would if he noticed a mate watching him scrub the deck. Others said they heard him, and others said he kept hiding their tools, which I couldn't help but laugh at. Anyway, I am a believer in spirits and or the presence of a higher power. I think he looks out for the safety of the boat and the crew aboard her. Or maybe spending a month or more aboard a 740-foot freighter makes one hear what is not heard by others, I'd like to believe the former. Anyway, thanks Larry, old buddy. Saved me from some busted up chins, maybe even a few teeth. I owe you one.